It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my first question this morning is to the Acting Premier. Earlier this morning, the Premier announced that he would be forced to back away from his cut-first, plan-later strategy of retroactive cuts to municipalities across Ontario. The Premier also confirmed that he was not cancelling the cuts, just delaying them. So whether this is an admission of incompetence or ignorance, if the Premier is now admitting that the cuts were a bad idea for this year, what makes the government think it was a good idea for next year? Questions to the Acting Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The, uh, the announcement that uh, the Premier and I made this morning was, uh, was very important. It was very important to Ontario's 444 municipalities that we maintain uh, the pre budget allocations uh, for land ambulance, public health, and for child care services. This has been a, an ongoing conversation that we've had with our municipal partners. As most uh, members in this House know, uh, I had a, a, a very good meeting with uh, mayors from Lumco. These are the mayors from uh, large urban municipalities in our province. And, you know, uh, our municipal partners, I, I think, uh, because of this conversation, all agree that there is, uh, is only one taxpayer speaker, and the job of finding savings and protecting what matters most is a shared responsibility Response. among every elected politician in this province. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, any government worth its salt would have the conversation with partners in advance of massive cuts retroactive to their budget, Speaker. For weeks and weeks on end, this Premier has blustered in this legislature and on any talk radio program that would have him, insisting that deep cuts to public health, to child care, to emergency services, to libraries wouldn't, fit, wouldn't hit families hard. Now he's finally admitting that he and every Conservative in this chamber that voted for his budget was wrong. Yeah. Is the government willing to consider that it's not just the timing of these cuts, but the cuts themselves that may be the problem here? The question is referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, uh, Speaker, I want to remind the Honourable Member that we have a number of municipalities that are very interested in our audit and accountability fund. This is a, this is a seven point. $5 billion fund that will go line by line in those municipal budgets looking for uh, a possible four cent uh, uh, savings. Uh, the, the other issue is the $200 million that we gave Ontario's most small, uh, the smallest and most rural communities in our province. We gave them a $200 million uh, boost to help uh, with modernization. And, and make no mistake, Speaker, we've listened to municipalities. Our government is being responsive to municipalities, and we want to work with them. We want to work with them, and I think it's very reassuring that the two levels of government are moving forward on trying to find those efficiencies together in a collaborative manner. Speaker. Response. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, I'd like to remind this honourable minister that he used to be a municipal politician and a mayor and should never have let these cuts go forward in the first place. But once again, once again, this government has been forced to, ba go, to go back to the drawing board after cutting first and planning after. Yeah. Mayors and municipal leaders across Ontario have been very clear that they're ready to work with the government, but not if the plan is unilateral cuts to the services that families in this province rely on. Whether it's public health and emergency services or child care and planning, is this premier, is this government actually going to listen? going to sit down and listen and work with municipal leaders, or is the Premier going to keep playing my way or the highway with Ontario? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, what the honourable member uh, doesn't remember is the fact that our government inherited a fiscal mess in this province. She we inherited a $15 billion dollar deficit the from, the, from the previous government, often supported by Always. her party and, and the members of, of her benches. And again, what we're moving forward with, Speaker, is a collaborative approach with Ontario's municipalities. They asked us for time. 
to be able to work with us to find order to find the savings i think i think most municipal leaders that i've spoken to over the weekend and and certainly at lumco on friday they want to work with us they want to use the tools that our government is providing whether it be the audit and accountability fund the municipal modernization fund there's tremendous political will out there speaker here, here. at the municipal level to work with our government to try to find those efficiencies and and, and the, those fiscal constraints and try to relieve those constraints from our government speaker we're going to work cooperatively with ontario thank you very much the next question the next question once again the leader of the official opposition thank you speaker my next question is also to the acting premier two years ago i had the um, opportunity to meet a gentleman named leon pops allward he was one of the many people suffering from opioid addiction who was fighting uh, for overdose prevention sites back in the day. Friends inform us that he died this weekend, the latest victim in this crisis. This morning, the government went to the Weston Harbour Castle to discuss their plans for mental health and addictions. Will they be reversing their decision to close six overdose prevention sites? The question is to the Acting Premier. <coughs> Minister of Labour, please. Referred to the Minister of Labour. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and of course, we're very saddened to hear of the passing uh, of the individual. Um, we made a commitment to invest in mental health and addictions of $3.8 billion uh, over 10 years. The Minister of uh, Health and Long-Term Care has been a strong advocate on mental health, is mental health issues. She has looked um, at the best uh, ways to approach us that we continue to look at the best ways working with community organizations. We realize the opioid crisis is a critical situation. We, uh, the minister has addressed those issues, and we will be making more comments soon, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, this afternoon that will Response. also uh, give more information to the opposition. Thank you so much. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, one of the first acts of the Ford government upon coming into office was to cut $330 million a year from mental health and addictions funding. So following today's announcement, Speaker, will the government, government be reversing side come to order. that cut? <laughs> government side come to order. Minister of Labour. This is not one easy fix. We have to work with our partners in the communities. And, Mr. Speaker, there has been an increase in funding in health. Mr. Speaker, uh, mental health and addictions and health in general have had an increase. Uh, the minister has worked very strongly with the community groups. Uh, this is a long-term approach that we have to take. We can't uh, flip a switch and make it uh, all better. This has to be uh, communications with community services. So when we it increased $1.3 billion, Mr. Speaker, in our budget uh, this year. That is an investment that is going to strengthen our health in our province and strengthen the health teams on the ground. Mr. Speaker, our commitment to mental health, our commitment to health in the province of Ontario is strong, and we will continue to work with everyone, and I hope the NDP will join us, in helping Response. to solve this multi-pronged health care approach that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, for people struggling with mental illness, for people literally dying every day from addictions, this government's concern is welcome, but only if it's matched with an actual commitment to undo the damage that they have already done. And undo the damage that they continue to do through callous cuts and policies that ignore the opioid crisis destroying families and taking lives across Ontario. If the government is serious about a commitment, a word this minister used several times in her most recent response, but if they are serious about a commitment to addressing mental health and addictions, will they recognize that the first step is undoing the serious damage that they have already caused? Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, we've increased the health budget by $1.3 billion. We've doubled the number of consumption sites, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, community health, mental health service, including priority populations, including fr francophones, by 23.5 million. Uh, Opposition mental side, come to order. Services, including mobile uh, team safe beds and court support workers, by 18.33 billion. Supportive houses, by 15.2 million. Children and youth mental health services, including in school and on campus supports, by 58.6 million. Indigenous mental health and addiction you services, by 12.77 million. Community and residential addictions, Order. including opioids, by 33.13 million. Inpatient hospital Response. beds, by 12 million. Data and quality support uh, by 500,000, Mr. Speaker. That's a long list of improvements that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and we on this side of the government have made. So, Mr. Speaker, the opposition. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. Once again, the leader of the opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My, my next question is uh, to the acting premier, but the minister might want to correct her record. They did not double the number of safe injection sites. They cut them by six. The Ford government has claimed that their budget protects the services that people rely on the most. We hear this ad nauseum around the House. So can the Acting Premier explain why the government is ending the Transition Child Benefit, which provides supports to Ontario's most vulnerable children? Acting Premier. Minister of Com Children, Community and Social Services. Referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, let's be clear. There will be a slow and gradual wind down of the transitional child benefit, and the recipients will be notified directly well in advance of the implementation of the uh, We are one of only a few provinces that has implemented this uh, transitional child benefit, but I asked the member opposite back. Is it fair to give a taxpayer subsidy to those who are crossing the border illegally and will likely be Opposition come to order. Is it fair to provide a taxpayer Opposition subsidy come to, order. to those who do not file? Apologize to the minister for having to interrupt. The opposition must come to order so that I can hear the minister respond to the question. Back to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The government believes that all governments, uh, that all Ontarians should have equal access and fair access to Ontario's children's benefits, which is why we're actually increasing the Ontario Child Benefit to well over $1.2 billion a year. But we do take exception Response. to those who do not file taxes, and that is why we are making this move on a gradual and transitional basis. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, our party, the official opposition, believes every child deserves the necessities of life. That's what we believe. Every child deserves the necessities of life. This is a benefit that provides support to single mothers. S support to single mothers that may not be, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 putting a tax return in. So they didn't put their tax return in. This is a supplement that helps them to feed their kids, Speaker. Often, yes, refugees who fled their countries to make a new life in Canada are also folks that rely on this benefit. This is a province filled with immigrants and refugees, Speaker. That's how this province was built. And to suggest that the government should not be responsible for making sure that every child can at least have a, a meal and a roof over their head is a disgraceful place for this government to be proud of. It is absolutely shameful. These single Question. mothers, uh, one agency said, are the hardest hit with children that uh, they have to look over, uh, look after. And without daycare subsidies that are also being cut by the province, they won't be able to work. They're not going to be able to go to school. Has the government given any consideration to the implications of this cut? And how many children? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Minister to reply. Thanks. Let me be perfectly clear. Refugee claimants will continue to receive support through the Ontario Social Assistance System. The transitional child benefit is provided to recipients who already receive social assistance but do not qualify for the Ontario child benefit. Primarily, they are refugee claimants and illegal border crossers. They are those who have not filed their income Order. taxes and those whose income is too high. The opposition has to come to order. The opposition needs to come to order. Order. I'm going to let the, uh, the member respond. 
Include her response, I should say. I have been in this House for 11 months calling on Justin Trudeau to repay the $90 million in social assistance costs that have been caused by his failed border policies. Why won't the NDP stand up with the Ontario Progressive Conservative government and every other state? Okay. Order. The opposition come to order. Order. Opposition, come to order. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, come to order. The next question, the member for York Centre. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Our government made a historic announcement unveiling a transit plan that will reduce congestion and get the people of Ontario moving. It's a $28.5 billion vision to expand our subway network by 50 per cent. This is the most money ever invested to get shovels into the ground to get new subways built. People waited long enough for an integrated regional transit system that extends outside of Toronto city limits to serve the growing communities across the region. Tens of thousands of people transfer between the TTC and GO Transit every day. It's time to start treating the TTC like the vital service that it is. Could the Minister of Transportation expand more on the benefits of this historic announcement? The Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from York Centre for uh, that great, great question. And as he says, we're going to build, 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 Mr. Speaker. Just as uh, he mentioned, the Premier last month announced a plan for the 21st century. It's a plan that will get Ontarians moving and ensure that these new transit lines are indeed built. Mr. Speaker, the new Ontario line will provide real relief for congestion on Line 1. It'll be twice as long, move twice as many people, and Mr. Speaker, compared to the original line, it'll be cost about the same amount of price. And that's great news for Ontario and our, and our, and our Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, not only will we, we uh, build almost the same price, the city had previously wanted the relief line built by 2029. Mr. Speaker, we're going to get the Ontario line built by 2027, Mr. Speaker, two years ahead of schedule. It's an incredible project, Mr. Speaker. Response? It's going to reduce overcrowding on the line, make it safer for people and get people home that much quicker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. There's no doubt that people across Ontario and the region will be pleased with the benefits of the Ontario line once it is built. It's an incredible project that will relieve overcrowding on the Young University Spadina line and connect new neighbourhoods. Speaker, this is one of the most important transit projects in Toronto right now. Relief is needed, and it's needed immediately. With only one extension built in 15 years, commuters using the TTC have been waiting for this for years with no results or action. Will the minister please inform the House of our firm and concrete commitment to get shovels on the Ontario line into the ground? Minister of Transportation. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you again for the uh, follow-up question. And that member is absolutely correct. Uh, this project has taken far too long to get started. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, did not make much uh, ground with regards to transit files, and the City of Toronto simply doesn't have the capacity to ensure that these lines are built. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure if they did, Mayor John Tory would have the shovels in the ground already, but uh, we're going to help the city, we're going to help the province, we're going to upload the subway system if the bill passes in the next week and a half, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we're going to ensure that these subways are built. Mr. Speaker, for years, everyone has challenged the provincial government to step up in a leadership role, and our government has done so. That's why we are going to work to continue to upload the subway system, and that's why we've allocated $11.2 billion on a Response. firm, concrete commitment to get this Ontario line built. Mr. Speaker, we are going to bring relief to this system. We're going to bring relief to Ontarians. We're going to build a regional integrated transit network, and we're going to do it during our term. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. This government is cutting $84 million for children and youth at risk, including cuts to children's aid societies that are already stretched to the limit. Speaker, we know that the children's aid societies could use improvement to better protect vulnerable children. But instead of th making things better, this Premier is once again forcing Ontario's most vulnerable to bear the burden of his cuts. How exactly do these cuts improve the lives of vulnerable children and keep them safe? Good question. Acting Premier. Minister of uh, Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. Social had services. the opportunity last week to address this issue. We're not cutting $84 million from Ontario's Children's Aid Societies. In fact, what we're doing is we're working with the Children's Aid Societies right across the province to ensure that we have a better back office system. Uh, we're working with them and we're excited about that. I'm looking forward this week to visiting some of those uh, Children's Aid Societies. But let me be perfectly clear where that number does come from. We have a number of youth detention facilities in the province of Ontario that are underutilized. In fact, many of the these uh, facilities are utilized only at 29 per cent capacity. I personally don't believe children should be jailed. I think that we need to put frontline investment in to making sure that they have a hand up and a greater deal of success. So I asked the member opposite, does she believe that we should put money into preventing kids from being in youth detention facilities, or does she think we should lock them up? Supplementary question. Speaker. Time and time again, this government has made cuts on the backs of vulnerable children. The ultimate test for any change that affects children should be, does this keep our kids safe? Will it improve the well-being of children? But this government's $84 million cut from children and youth at risk fails this test. It puts children served by children's aid societies and children experiencing the justice system further at risk. Why does this government think that it is acceptable to put the safety and livelihood of our most vulnerable children at risk once again? Minister. The member opposite simply did not uh, listen to my initial response. Let me be clear. The government is not cutting $84 million from the child welfare system. The figure in the estimates includes changes in the youth justice system and community prevention and largely reflect that the government will be spending less money on jailing kids. I asked the member opposite again. Is that what she would prefer? She would prefer to see children locked up rather than being part of a preventative approach within our community? Position One come of the to biggest order. things that we're working on as a government is to, is to prevent the guns and gangs uh, challenges that we face in our largest cities like Ottawa and Toronto. And That's why one of the first announcements I made as minister was to ensure that we had greater youth prevention uh, supports in place in the city of Ottawa. I'll get, I'm going to continue to do that, but let me be perfectly clear. I don't think we need jails for children that are operating at 29 per cent. We need to give them a hand up, not lock them up. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the finance minister. And uh, This morning we've heard that, uh, and we've heard the response of the minister uh, about the child uh, transition child benefit that's being taken away. So my question is really simple. Why does the finance minister think that taking this transitional child benefit away from some of the most vulnerable children and families in this province is a good idea? Thank you, Speaker. Questions to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Oh, thanks very much, Speaker. As the member opposite well knows, our government made a decision early on in our mandate that we would be reforming social assistance. Right now, we have a $10 billion program where a million people are relying on social assistance, yet still one in seven live in poverty. We have invested a, 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 a historic amount of money into the Ontario, Ontario Child Benefit, over $1.2 million. We're going to continue with those approaches. We're continuing to work with our municipal partners to ensure that we have a, an effective approach moving forward so we have less people relying on a government check and more people looking towards self-reliance as they their goal toward a more dignified approach in the province of Ontario. That's what we're doing with respect to social assistance. That's what we're going to continue to do as a government, and we want to make sure that uh, not only are people working, but that they're contributing to our society in other Response. ways as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, that, did, that, didn't ask, that didn't answer the question. And the, the, the minister's earlier response 
was shocking to me because I can't believe that children would be a pawn in their support of Andrew Scheer in the federal election. It's incredible. I can't believe it. So let's look at the government's that record, Mr. Speaker. Okay? They made OHIP plus, order. OHIP minus. They've canceled the basic income pilot with no order. notice or consultation. They've had the Arkham increases for families on social assistance. They've fired the child advocate. They've put families of children Our with autism to hell with the new OAP. They've cut funding for children's aid societies. They're increasing class sizes in our schools. They've cut OSAP. They froze wait lists and funding for SSAH, passport, and autism. And the list goes on and on. And who knows what's Order. next? So through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Finance Minister or the Ministry of Children, have they declared war on children and families in this province? Stop the clock. I recognize that most of the government members were listening to the question, and I could hear most of what the member for Ottawa South said. But about three or four members were screaming at the top of their lungs across the House. It's not acceptable behaviour in the Parliament of Ontario. Think about it. Start the clock. The minister can reply. We have a war on in this government. It is the $1 billion a, a month that they left us for the children of the next generation, our children, our grandchildren. That's what the Liberal Party left us, a $15 billion deficit that ensured that we have compromised our core and value public services like health care, like education, like social services. They bankrupted, come they bankrupted the province of Ontario. They bankrupted the Ontario Autism Program. They left the province come to bankrupt order. of ideas. If anyone has anything to answer on in this, in this chamber, it is the Liberal Party of Ontario. When I was reminding the members that you can't yell across the House, and I was looking at the government side, the same remarks apply to the members on this side of the House, including the member for Don Valley East. Next question. Yeah. The next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Start the Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Since taking over this crucial file, the Minister has helped make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. By repealing the job-killing aspects of Bill 148, and modernizing health and safety training and employment standards. Last week, the minister announced that our government for the people is conducting an operational review of the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, or WSIB. Speaker, the WSIB plays a key role in protecting Ontario workers, families and employers by providing financial support and return to work programs for people who are injured on the job. Can the minister inform the House about how this review is going to help the WSIB continue to provide sustainable services to the workers, families and job creators it serves? Questions to the Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Oakville North Burlington for the question and the great work that she does in her riding. Thursday, I had the honour of keeping a key commitment of our fall economic statement by announcing an operational review of the WSIB. The review will focus on administration and operations, including financial oversight, sustainability and controls, administration, the effectiveness of the current WSIB governance and executive management structure, and efficiency the cost efficiency and effectiveness of operations, including comparisons to other jurisdictions and private sector insurers. The review will help ensure the long-term success of the WSIB and will provide our government with the timely advice to ensure a sustainable Response. system based on industry best practices. Reviewing and improving the WSIB is one of the main, many ways our government is ensuring that Ontario can continue to attract <laughs> investment and good jobs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. I know our government for the people is currently conducting MPP-led reviews 
of all provincial agencies to ensure we are providing the best services and value for Ontario families. We are also committed to helping people, job creators and municipalities save money, like the Ministry of Labour did with Bill 66, which will allow municipalities like the City of Toronto to save nearly, nearly half a billion dollars a year by accepting open tendering. Speaker, could the minister share more information about the independent experts named to the review panel and how the people of Ontario can give their feedback and suggestions to improve the operations of the WSIB? Great question. Minister. I'll thank the member again for the excellent question. The review will be conducted by Linda Regner Dykman, the head of Midcorp Canada, who has more than 25 years of experience in field <coughs> insurance, leadership, and business strategy, and Sean Spear, a senior fellow in public policy at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. These professionals were selected based on their respective areas of expertise to cover the unique mandate of the WSIB. Speaker, we're actively seeking public input on this review over the next two months. And finally, while I am confident that areas of improvement can always be found, I want to point out that the WSIB is currently managed very well. In fact, last September, they retired their unfunded liability Order. 10 years ahead of schedule, which allowed us which allowed us to, to reduce uh, rates by an average Member for of Waterloo, cents, come to order. giving a $1.45 billion boost back into our economy. This helps employers save money, increases investment, and makes Ontario open for business and, Mr. Speaker, open for jobs. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Last week, we learned that the PC government plans to launch a review of WSIB. This government has already slashed its employer contribution, which means less compensation for injured workers who are already struggling. In Ontario, a workplace injury or illness often means that worker and their family are forced to live in poverty. Now this government plans to alter WSIB and appears to open the door for privatization. Will the acting premier tell us, does this government want to privatize WSIB? The acting premier, Minister of Labour, referred to the Minister of Labour. No, Mr. Speaker, we are not privatizing WSIB. <laughs> Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, Speaker. Back to the acting premier. Government side, come to order. Workers in this province deserve a government that protects and supports their rights, not one intended on clawing back the compensation they are owed. And I want to be clear in this: no injured worker in the province of Ontario should live in poverty because of a workplace injury or an illness. Will this PC government stop talking about it and actually stand up for working people in this province, or are they going to continue to help their millionaire friends save a quick buck on the backs of workers in the province of Ontario? Members, please take your seats. Minister of Labour to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I do strongly object to the question that's been answered. Uh, I'm, and I'm saddened but not surprised to hear about the continued fear-mongering from the opposition and the attitude that they have, Mr. Speaker, uh, throwing words like privatization, privatization around, cutting benefits, it's capitalizing on and politicizing come to order. worker injuries, and frankly, that is beneath the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. When we speak about reviewing WSIB, we want to make sure it's running well. When we say that we, the uh, unfunded liability was paid off position come to order than supposed to that provides sustainability for injured workers that may have to access WSIB mr. speaker we want businesses to invest in not only their businesses Bonds. but in their workers mr. speaker providing to, to sustainable WSIB is going to help everybody involved mr. speaker so no to privatization and yes stop the clock
Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Kitchener, South Hespler. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. Speaker, our government was elected to protect what matters most to the people of Ontario, including ending hallway medicine and building a connected mental health and addiction system. Mr. Speaker, in my riding of Kitchener South Hespler, my constituents have witnessed firsthand the devastation of the opioid crisis. It has cost the people of Ontario tremendously, both in terms of lives lost and its impact on the front lines of our health care system. Will the Attorney General please tell us how our government is working to address the concerns of the people of Ontario with regards to the opioid crisis? I'm going to ask the member for Don Valley East. Stop the clock. The member for Don Valley East and the member for King Vaughan will come to order. York Centre. I apologize to the member for King Vaughan. It was an honest mistake. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. The member for York Centre will come to order. I believe it's the Attorney General's turn. <laughs> Start the clock. I would um, I'd like to thank the member from Kitchener South Hespeler for her question and for the great work that she does on behalf of her constituents. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this morning we announced how Ontario is protecting what matters most by taking action to improve quality mental health and addiction services and to recover health care costs due to the opioid crisis. Today, our government will propose a bill that stands up for the people of Ontario and holds opioid manufacturers and wholesalers accountable. If passed, the bill would support Ontario's participation in the class action lawsuit British Columbia launched last year against, for, against more than 40 opioid manufacturers and wholesalers. Mr. Speaker, we intend to invest any proceeds awarded as a result of this litigation back into frontline mental health and addiction services in the province of Ontario. Right. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm back to the Attorney General. The opioid crisis has cost the people of this province a great deal both in terms of, again, those lives lost and the impact that it's had on our frontline health care workers. Could the Attorney General tell us more about that class action lawsuit brought by British Columbia and the importance of our government's proposed support for this lawsuit on behalf of the provincial, territorial and federal governments against those 40 manufacturers and wholesalers involved in the sale and distribution of opioids? The Attorney General reply. I would like to thank the member for her question, Mr. Speaker. It is important for producers and wholesalers to be responsible of their actions in order to take back these, uh, the cost to the health care to health care that are taken on by by our citizens. If we take part in this class action. We will not be responsible for the legal costs, given that private lawyers will be paid after this is settled. Our government will invest in the settlement of this class action, and we will invest in health care and uh, mental health. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Attorney General. Women across Ontario were concerned weeks ago when Conservative MPPs joined anti-choice protesters on the lawn and pledged to make abortion unthinkable in our lifetime. And they were even more concerned when the Premier declined an opportunity here in the Legislature to distance himself from those remarks. Now, Radio Canada is reporting that the Ford government has ignored requests from a dozen health facilities seeking protections from anti-choice protesters who harass and intimidate women seeking services. The right to a protection zone is a legal right established in this legislature. 
Why is the government ignoring organizations that are desperately asking for their protection zones to be approved? Thank you. I leave the question to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, our government has been very clear that we are not reopening the debate on the question of abortion in Ontario. With respect to safe uh, zones around abortion clinics, eight clinics have been have applied and been approved for uh, for for the for the for those zones to to be respected, uh, and an independent committee reviews all future applications. Uh, there are uh, applications that are being currently under that are currently under consideration by that independent committee. Uh, there are privacy concerns, uh, and there is currently litigation ongoing. And so I can't comment specifically on applications that are under review. But the safe bubble zone uh, system is in place in the province of Ontario, and we continue. We can. We will continue to respect it. Supplementary question. Yeah, back to the Attorney General. You know, we're asking for the bubble zones to be approved. Quite frankly, you're not doing your job. The Premier says, may say he's not reopening Order. the debate, but we see Conservative MPPs on the lawn promising to make abortion unthinkable. Well, this government okay. is literally ignoring women seeking the protections that they're promised under law. For women across Ontario, it seems like the debate hasn't gone away. And the Premier is siding with forces that would chip away at women's hard-earned rights. Will the Attorney General commit, do your job, and commit to protecting the legal rights and ensuring that women's access to abortion services for women who need them? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, as I made clear in my previous answer, it is the job of an independent committee to review the applications for those zones. It is our job to ensure that we uphold the laws and regulations of this land, and we continue to do that. But, Mr. Speaker, we've been clear we are not reopening the debate on the question of abortion, and people who clinics that wish to apply for zones can do so to an independent committee, and we abide by the, re by the reports and the decisions of that committee, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Ontario finds itself in a fiscal nightmare. For the past 15 years, the previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, put off making tough decisions. Speaker, leadership is about making those tough decisions, the tough decisions required to turn this province around. Mr. Speaker, my constituents sent our Premier and our team to Queen's Park to clean up this mess, and that's exactly what we're doing. It started with a line-by-line -line audit of the previous government's waste and mismanagement, and it's culminated in a budget and a year of an aggressive legislative agenda. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing please share with this House what our government is doing to find efficiencies across the board to help bring Ontario's finances back under control? Questions to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the uh, member for Willowdale for that uh, that question and his comments. Uh, Speaker, uh, I've heard from mayors and councillors across this province. Uh, the Premier also knows from the uh, time he spent uh, at City Council uh, here in Toronto that municipalities need not just the time but also the flexibility to find savings. Uh, that's why our government announced this morning that we would be pausing this year's cost-sharing changes to land ambulance, uh, to public health, and to uh, the child care sector. Uh, the changes are going to allow uh, municipalities to do a number of things, Speaker. It's going to allow them to be able to leverage the $7.35 million we've, we've uh, put forward for an audit and accountability fund. It will allow uh, Ontario's smallest municipalities to deal with uh, the $200 million of modernization funds that we gave them in the last fiscal year. And, and more importantly, uh, Speaker, it also allows us to work together. Ontarians face a, a fiscal challenge together. It's, more, it's most important that we work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's very clear that there are plenty of examples of waste and mismanagement across the province, so it's really reassuring to see that our government is acting to tackle those issues. Our, pre our Premier promised uh, that, that the party with the taxpayers' money is over. Now, the Premier and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing announced some new changes this morning. 
Could the minister please outline how our government's plans to work collaboratively with our municipal partners to restore trust and accountability to Ontario's finances will work? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member. Uh, as I was saying uh, in uh, my first answer, Ontarians face uh, a fiscal challenge, and we want to face it together with our municipal partners in providing uh, this opportunity to pause some of those in-budget changes. We can, we can now sit down with our municipal partners, and really, uh, you know, I believe, and I think uh, most in this House will believe, that, that because there is only one taxpayer, we have to work collaboratively and cooperatively with Ontario's municipalities. I mentioned the two funds, the $7.35 million of the Audit and Accountability Fund. I had a number of mayors uh, express uh, their interest in using that fund to try to find uh, four cents on the dollar. We've, uh, we've also heard, Speaker, uh, through you new members of this House, uh, a, a lot of great suggestions from uh, those small communities, given that we've uh, been able to present them with that $200 million of municipal, account, uh, municipal modernization fund. There are a lot of good suggestions. There's a, a great political will to, uh, to work with our government to ensure that they can find the efficiencies to help, help us meet our fiscal challenge and to protect what matters most. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kiwet uh, Miigwech, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Acting Premier. Last week, uh, this government uh, announced uh, the new curriculum for Indigenous Studies after uh, abruptly cancelling Indigenous curriculum writing sessions last summer. But Indigenous leaders like the Nisnabaski Nation uh, were not met uh, prior to the release of the curriculum. Updating the Indigenous curriculum was a recommendation from the TRC. Uh, it should have been developed by Indigenous communities. But uh, to make matters worse, uh, Mr. Speaker, the government is making a uh, new Indigenous curriculum an elective, not a mandatory course. Why does the government think that Ontario students do not need to learn about residential schools or First Nation treaty rights? The Acting Premier. The Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. I very much appreciated the opportunity to be in Thunder Bay and, and Sioux Lookout this past week. And uh, I was pleased to join the, the member opposite at the opening of Sioux North as well. It was a great celebration. And the whole week is really about celebration because the fact of the matter is, this is the first time ever this, there's been an absolutely dedicated effort to make sure their Indigenous curriculum is developed. And I have to impress upon the fact that we have given students the opportunity to make to take many of our new courses, and they'll take them and they'll be counted as compulsory studies required to graduate. And, you know, in talking to the Director of Education as well, he agreed that many of the courses Response. that are offered are mandatory. You know, it's a celebration that we have finally brought forward a suite of 10 courses that touch on the realities of Indigenous. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, last week, also, Grand Chief uh, Alvin Fiddler stated that learning about the colonial history of this country should not be optional. Uh, and, and as long as we make these courses uh, electives, the, the system will continue to fail all students. As a First Nations person, it's hard for me to accept this government's uh, this government is committed to meaningful reconciliation when they have cut funding to Indigenous culture and arts, significantly cutting the, uh, the budget of the uh, Ministry of Indigenous Affairs and uh, canceled the, canceling the Indigenous curriculum writing sessions. Will the government today, Mr. Speaker, make an appropriate curriculum on residential schools, treaties, Indigenous, indigenous uh, people's contributions, a mandatory uh, education requirement in Ontario, as stated in the TRC calls to action number 62. I need a simple answer, please. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the members to please take their seats. Minister of Education, reply. Thank you very much. And, Speaker, our new courses that have been introduced as of last week, again, are going to be counted as compulsory studies in literature, in law, in humanities 
politics and history. And you know, when I was up north, I heard a lot of support for the decision I made to expand the grad, cro the grad coach program as well. Do you know, people are very, very much absolutely applauding the fact that we actually expanded our grad Order. coach program so that we can ensure our, our Indigenous students are graduating and having a great path forward. And also, order. Like, I said opposition come week, to order. like I said last week, if the opposition cared to listen, I heard— The opposition will come to order. Member for Waterloo has to come to order. Allow the minister to finish her reply. Mr. Speaker, because if the opposition would listen, they would hear loud and clear that I had a great week up north. And Grand Chief Elvin Fiddler and I had a wonderful discussion at the airport. And I'm pleased to say that starting in June, we'll be meeting with our Indigenous partners and working with them on an approach that could include future curriculum revisions. And this is good news. We had a great trip next week, or last week. What am I saying? We had a great trip Response. last week. We're looking forward to what we're doing in the future. And the fact of the matter is we're getting it right. People know I care. And I Thank you very much. <laughs> Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. For months now, you have been a steadfast advocate for Ontario's taxpayer by standing up to Justin Trudeau and his government's failed border policies. You have told us how the federal government's inaction has driven up costs for Ontario's taxpayers with the $200 million in added costs to our social assistance, education and legal systems. Months later, the federal government still hasn't fully reimbursed taxpayers, and our government has been forced to protect what matters most. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how our government is protecting all children from Justin Trudeau's failed border policies? Very good question. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the honourable member for his question, and I appreciate his uh, his activism not only on behalf of the children of Ontario, but certainly his uh, local Raptors uh, basketball team. Um, for months now, uh, he knows uh, since last August, our government has called on the Trudeau Liberals to reimburse Ontario taxpayers for $200 million in added costs, including $90 million in our social assistance system. Ontario taxpayers cannot continue to afford to pay for the crisis at our border uh, through the added cost to our social assistance system to support illegal border crossers and uh, who are making those claims. We believe all Ontarians should have equal access to children's benefits, regardless of whether they are or are not receiving social assistance. We are going to be winding down the transitional child benefit and investing nearly $1.2 billion in the Ontario child benefit to provide equal support Response. to all low-income Ontarians who require assistance. The federal government, however, I, I uh, reiterate today, must take action to stem the flow of the illegal border crossers and clear the backlog of— Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you for your response, Minister. An article in the Toronto Sun last week detailed how nearly 4,000 people had crossed into the country illegally through, through the unofficial port Opposition of entry at Roxham Road. We know that a significant number of refugee claimants and illegal border crossers then travel to Ontario, where they are entitled to social assistance while they wait to have their refugee claim heard by a federal immigration board. This wait can take upwards to two years. Minister, it's unacceptable that these people are left in limbo while they wait for the federal Opposition government to, to show some leadership. Can the minister please tell us how Ontario supports refugee claimants? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask the member. I'm going to ask the minister. Minister. Yeah. The opposition must come to order. The member for Brampton Centre must come to order. Brampton North. I apologize, the member for Brampton Centre. Minister to reply equal access to children's benefits, regardless of whether they are or are not receiving social assistance. The truth is we are removing duplicate programs that add costs and red tape. We have a program to deliver child benefits. Everyone should file their taxes, however, Speaker. Does the member opposite not agree with that? Yes or no? 
Order. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Acting Premier. In a letter to the Premier last week, the Mayor of Ontario's 28 largest cities expressed serious concerns about Bill 108, the Ford government's plan to tilt the playing field in favour of developers at the expense of the environment, families and municipalities. The government plans to ram this bill through committee hearings this week with just a single day for public comment. These 28 mayors have asked for an extension to September 30th. Will the government listen and grant this extension, yes or no? Government housing. Uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, I was at LUMCO on uh, Friday, and I explained uh, to some of the concerns that uh, some of the uh, mayors had expressed. Uh, they had expressed a concern regarding uh, the creation of the new community benefits charge, and I made it very clear to them that uh, the announcements that we've made as part of Bill 108 uh, for uh, community benefits charge was that we announced a consultation and that we would continue to consult with Ontario's municipalities about the new development charges regime as opposed as confirmed in community benefits. So I believe exactly what uh, those mayors were asking, that we have some consultation, is what I delivered. The difference is, is that the bill can still continue through the legislative Response. process. It does not need to be stopped or halted. We, you know, the, the, clearly, we, we said we would consult on that section. Supplementary question. Well, I'll take that as a no, Speaker. It's a good sign that a government bill won't stand up to scrutiny when the government refuses to let people scrutinize it. These mayors, these mayors elected by millions of Ontarians are raising serious concerns about the government scheme. They warn that Bill 108 could put at risk cities' finances and their ability to provide parkland, community facilities and well-planned neighbourhoods. The Premier is finally learning to admit when he's wrong. Why is the government so afraid of taking time to hear the concerns of citizens, mayors and city councillors? Minister. Speaker, again, true to the honourable member, I was very clear on Friday at, uh, at uh, LUMCO. Our, our proposed community benefits charge and the formula that it would create maintains the position of growth pays for growth. Libraries will continue to be built. Parkland will, will continue to be open. Community centres will still be opened under the new proposed regime. We announced, Speaker, as part of Bill 108, we would consult with municipalities on this new formula. That's exactly what we're going to do. The next question, the member for Ajax. Thank you. Whitby. <laughs> My question is to the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Last week, Speaker, our Government for the People announced a very special partnership with one of the most well-known accessibility organizations in the country. Our great Minister of Seniors and Accessibility, along with the founder of the Rick Hansen Foundation, were at the Mars Discovery District to announce the launch of the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Cert Certification Program in Ontario. Can the Minister share with this House the importance of this program and what it means to both people with disabilities and seniors? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the very hard-working member from Whitby for the important question. Our government is focusing on what matters most to people with disabilities and seniors by helping to remove barriers in buildings and making communities more accessible. This is why our government is investing $1.3 million over two years through a new partnership with the Rick Hansen Foundation. This certification program will provide accessibility ratings of businesses and public buildings by trained professionals and determine ways to remove identified barriers. This will help make communities and businesses become more accessible and open for jobs and open for business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Supplementary question, Member Quick. Thank you, Speaker. And when our buildings are not accessible, Ontarians with disabilities are prevented from fully participating in everyday life, and businesses fail to reach their full potential. We must strive, Speaker, to make our communities as accessible as possible to accommodate every individual in our province. Speaker, the third legislative review of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act by David Onley stated that there are soul-crushing barriers in our communities. Could the minister please explain how our recent announcement will contribute to the government's commitment to enhancing accessibility across Ontario? Minister. As the member mentioned, the Honourable David Orley's report made it clear that the built environment is a significant challenge in our province. This 1.3 million investment will provide an innovative, Ontario-focused, low-burden accessibility certification program. They will encourage the organization to become more accessible. Through this investment, the Rick Hansen Foundation will undertake ratings of 250 facilities in select communities across Ontario. This is our small step to help removing accessibility barriers. This program will ensure that people with disabilities and the seniors can participate in daily life and help business grow. Bonds. A win-win for all Ontarians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Timmins. My question is for the acting premier. Uh, acting premier, the uh, school board that represents the area from Muskoka all the way up to, to Timmins, Kapuskasing, and beyond, the District School Board of Ontario Northeast, sent your Minister of Education a letter signed by Bob Brush, the chair of that particular school board. And I'm going to send this over after the question, but here's a nub of it. Your government has cut funding to autism services. We have 48 IBI spaces available within the system in that entire area. Our school board, which covers the same area, is now faced having to take all of these students into the school system and having to try to provide services to those children, and they don't have the money to do it. So my question to you is simple as this. You made a decision this morning to reverse some of the possible cuts that you're making to the municipalities. And ask the member to make his comments through the chair. Conclude his question. Yep. Mr. Yep. Speaker, I'm asking you the question. Are you prepared to do the same and reverse your cuts for children? Thank you. Yeah. Again, I will ask the members to make their comments through the chair. The response, the Minister of Education. Minister, well, government uh, house leader, I should say. The Minister of Education. Minister of Education. <laughs> And uh, I'm pleased to share with the member opposite and everyone in the House today that we're moving very thoughtfully and measured towards a proper manner in which to have our children with autism enter into the education system. You know, we've been having very good meetings with our uh, autism partners, and we're listening and we're going to get it right. And in terms of the manner in which we've invested in autism services, I need to remind the member opposite that we have taken on precedented steps to increase funding to support children and students with autism. One example, for ex uh, just to name one, is doubling the amount of money that's going to the Geneva Centre for Autism. That's just one example, and I certainly would be pleased to talk about more. There's so many more examples in terms of the increased support that we can give. And I look. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker, to the to the minister again. You have cut funding to children that need services to deal with autism. IBI therapy is being reduced. In our area, there are 48 spots that are available, and there's going to be probably very few left by the time this is all over. School boards like this particular school board is having to deal with what to do when those kids hit the classroom, right. and they don't have the resources to be able to provide the services. So I ask you again, what do you plan on doing in order to help students in this province get the funding through the school boards that they need to make sure that, sure that the kids with IBI Thank you. Once again, I ask the members to make the comments through the chair. Minister of Education to apply. 
Again, Speaker, I want to remind the member opposite that Rookie. we're a government and a ministry that works with our partners, and we're going to be very careful to make sure that we get it right. Opposition and come to order. To, if you want specific examples, I'll look forward to receiving that letter from his local school board, as well as working with him so he fully comprehends once and for all how we're investing Here. in children with autism. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our question period, but I once again want to apologize to the member for King Vaughan, the member for Brampton Centre, and the member for Whitby for mixing up their riding names. Points of order. First of all, the member for Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, I'd like to recognize and welcome my constituent supporter and uh, great community leader, Balwinder Singh Sur, and he also has a couple of relatives that are visiting all the way from India, Baljeet Singh and Gurjeet Kaur. Welcome. To the The member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Welcome all the steelworkers from Hamilton and Ontario. Great to have you here, and we'll be seeing you later. Thank you for coming. The Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My amazing wife, Janet, is here, and a special family member from Florida, uh, Sarah Etzcorn. We welcome you to this right, magnificent place. The member for Ottawa Centre. Ottawa Centre. Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I neglected to welcome earlier our friend Emily Dagg from, uh, from Mississauga Centre. She is an accessibility rights leader. Thank you, Emily, for being in your house. Thank you for coming here for National Accessibility Week. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to correct my record uh, from earlier. In fact, we have more than doubled the funding for the consumption and treatment sites, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm just, uh, I would like to correct my record. Uh, the reception for the independent pharmacist would be in room 230, not 228. Thank you. Members, that uh, the appropriate time for introductions is when I ask for introductions right before question period and at the start of the afternoon. I beg to inform the House that during the adjournment, the following documents were tabled. A report entitled Economic and Budget Outlook, Spring 2019, from the Financial Accountability Office of Ontario, and a report concerning the review of cabinet ministers and opposition leaders' expense claims, complete as of May the 17th, 2019, from the Office of the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario, and a report concerning the Honourable Lisa McLeod, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services from the Office of the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>